about to start. And it is about to start now. Professor NGA Shanta Gamage from the University of Sri Chavardhanapura, also the council members of the IPSL, all the members of the IPSL, and those who join with us in person here at NLT, as well as those who join with us via Zoom. To start the today's proceedings, I cordially invite the president of the IPSL, Professor Shanta Gamage, and the orator of the day, Professor Chandana Jayaratna, to garland the portrait of Professor W. A. Mailwaganam on behalf of the physics community to offer the honorable respect to his contribution on advancement of physics in Sri Lanka. Thank you, sir. The Malwagan Memorial Oration is an annual event organized to commemorate this first Sri Lankan professor in physics, Professor A.W. Malwagan. It's my honor to invite the president of the IPSL, Professor Shant Gamage, to brief the profound history of Professor Malwagan's stimuli on the encroachment of physics in Sri Lanka. And also, Professor Shantagamgi will have the honor of introducing our distinguished orator of the day, Professor KPS Chandana Jayaratna, to the gatherings. Dear professors, uh, academic staff members, council members of the IPSL, members of the IPSL, and um, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Mailwagen Memorial Oration is an annual event organized by the Institute of Physics Sri Lanka in memory of uh, late uh, Professor A.W. Mailwaganam, who is the first Sri Lankan physics professor. Uh, due to pandemic situation, we were unable to conduct uh, 2020 Mailwagana Moration, uh, although we uh, prepare all the uh, necessary things. However, this year we decided to conduct it in hybrid mode in this manner. Uh, so, before introducing our orator today, let me present Professor Mailwaganam's profound history of 
physics in Sri Lanka. Uh, Arumugan uh, Visavalingam Mailwaganam, who born in uh, 13th November 1906 in a little village called Sutumala. Professor Mailugana Vaimaganam's early education was at Japna Central College. After winning the government scholarship in 1920, he was admitted to Royal College, Colombo. Then he passed the uh, Cambridge Junior with the press class, Cambridge Senior with first class, and in 1923, matriculated in the first division. In uh, 1924, he won a scholarship to the Ceylon University, and at the age of 19, he obtained a BSc degree with uh, first class honors, coming first in Sri Lanka. Based on this result, in uh, 1927, he won a government scholarship to enter Cambridge University for a three-year special uh, course in physics. In uh, 1930, he passed the Cambridge uh, Natural Science Type course physics with uh, first class honors while he was conducting experimental research at Cambridge in 1933. He was called to take up his first academic position as a lecturer at the University College, uh, Ceylon. In return to Ceylon, he continued his research, and in 1938, he was awarded a PhD in Canterbury, based on his uh, research carried out in Ceylon. In uh, 1939, he was chosen for the chair professor in physics, University of Ceylon. He was also twice elected Dean of the Faculty of Science. In his uh, Cambridge days, he has worked under the Nobel Prize winners, CTR William Wilson and Ernest Rutherford. On March 25th, uh, 1987, the media announced the death of Professor A.W. Mailwaganam. So every year we commemorate this eminent physics, uh, physicist in this manner. So let me introduce uh, today's orator. It is honor and a great privilege uh, me to introduce our guest speaker to uh, today, Vidya Kirti Professor KPS Chandana Jayaratna. Professor Jayaratna, Chandra Jayaratna is an old boy of the Nalanj College, Colombo and also a recipient of the Nalanda Kirtisi Award given only to less than 10 eminent personalities produced by Nalanda. He entered into the Faculty of Science, University of Colombo in 1979 and passed out in 1983 with a BSc physics special degree honors and serving the same university as a lecturer uh, in physics since 1984. Currently, he is serving as the head of the Department of Physics, University of Colombo, and also as the director of the Astronomy and Space Science Unit of the department. He was the general president of the Sri Lanka Association for the Advancement of Science in 2018. He has done a yeoman service to develop the astronomy as well as lightning physics research and lightning protection work in Sri Lanka. In addition to his never ending dedicated uh, effort on popularizing science in Sri Lanka. He was also a person involved in establishment the biggest telescope in country in the country at the Arthur C. Clarke Institute for Modern Technology in Moratua and was a consultant to the Astronomy and Space Science Division of Arthur C. Clark Institute for over two decades. Professor Jairatna is also serving the Ministry of Science and Technology Advisory Committee on Sri Lanka, uh, is in the national coordinator of and founder of the Sri Lankan Astronomy and Astrophysics Olympiad and Sri Lanka Junior Astronomy Olympiad, and also the Sri Lankan representative and a board member of the International Board on Astronomy and Astrophysics Olympiad and also a member of International Committee on Space Research. The 23rd International Olympiad on Astronomy was held in Sri Lanka in October 2018 under the uh, 
chairmanship of Professor Jayaratna. It is related, rated as one of the best international astronomy Olympiad conducted since the inception of IAO. Uh, number of public talks, newspaper articles, TV and radio programs on astronomy and science related subject uh, came from him are well over thousand. Professor Jairatna has served in several board and councils such as NIE, SLSI, and currently serve as a council member of National Research Council slash IPSL and member of board of Governor Governors, uh, Arthur C. Clark Institute for Modern Technology, executive committee member of OPA. He was a past president of also IPSL. He has over 10 MPL and PhD students currently conducting their research under his supervision. A team of three scientists, including Professor Chandra Jayaratta and one of those research students in 1990, 1990 had discovered a new planetary system with a two planet some 1,132 light years away, which received wide national and international publicity. Professor Jairatna has published over 170 research articles and publications in local and international journals. To his credit, he received in 1991, the third World Academy of Science Prize for Young Scientists, uh, the prize uh, for physics awarded by NSF and uh, the GRC General Research Committee uh, uh, the General Research Committee Merit Award for his contribution to Sri Lanka uh, since and in 1996. In recognition of his service, skills, and capabilities, he was honored by various national and international organizations with several distinguished honorary awards and citations with number exceeding 25. So we are grateful to, for accepting our invitation for delivering my Wagner Memorial Oration 2021. What to you, sir? I must thank all the IPSL council members who are here and the others. Some research history. Uh, it is a, a remarkable year for the Columbia University, of course, uh, because we are celebrating 100 years. This is a
one one okay i can go to the podium also no no it's okay uh, then uh, this is the first advertisement but it was advertised in in uk right uh, and silon there is a vacancy for a professor of physics in the university college colombo silon a candidate should hold a first class honors degree in physics uh, this is mind you 100 years ago in a british university of equivalent qualification he should also have had experience preferably at the university as a lecturer or, uh, or a teacher or physics, teacher of physics of high standard uh, salary is uh, 950 uh, sterlings uh, to 1150 sterlings uh, that is uh, uh, that is per, per year and then uh, of course a single officer may the family rental uh, that it will be and uh, the ap appointment will be on pro on probation for three years uh, it will then be on the uh, and establishment right? and will uh, will uh, contribute four percent of of the salary to the widow and of an of an uh, wa fund pension fund just provided to silo and four officer and his wife and two children uh, so you can see that uh, uh, that the necessary forms applications should be addressed to the uh, uh, private secretary uh, colonial office 38 all queen's street london right so this is first advertisement to recruit a professor uh, to establish university of colombo or, or university of ceylon at that time college it was not uh, university of ceylon it was university college right and then of course uh, that professor came here and then uh, professor jw hinton in 1933 uh, he was also from new zealand actually has been studied advanced electricity and magnetism before joining the staff of Columbia university college and thereafter in uh, from uh, 1936 to 1939 uh, professor andrews uh, was the uh, uh, was the uh, professor in physics, uh, professor of physics, but all those were uh, from um, British origin. Right? And you can see the timetable in 1920s. Uh, it was actually uh, this is uh, geography, zoology, Latin, geography, Greek, applied mathematics, pure mathematics, education, etc., uh, etc. Et uh, so then it was. Uh, mainly to cater the medical faculty uh, or medical college at that time the medical college was more older than the Colombo uh, university is 1840 it was there and then um, 42 july uh, university of ceylon was established right uh, and then by the year 1952 most of the faculty of arts and the library had shifted to Veradenia, while the faculty of science remained in Colombo alongside the central administration of operating from the college house. To accommodate the increase in demand for science education in the country, a separate student intake in uh, science to Peradeniya was considered after the formation of the Faculty of Science in Peradeniya in 1961. And the institution started uh, operating independently from 1967. So it's the science faculty and our art faculty are the, uh, the two oldest in the higher education system in the country, it is uh, 100 years. So in this system, the first Sri Lankan professor was uh, uh, Professor A.W. Mailwagana from 1939 to 1972, uh, right? And then he was also a, a dean and several times acting vice chancellor. Uh, and uh, uh, 1949, Professor Mailwagana received the British Royal Merit of Officer of the Order of British Empire. Uh, then Vidya Jyoti Award, and he was also the president of uh, Sri Lanka Association for the Advancement of Science. Now, in those, those days, he was an association for the advancement of science, and also a member of the University Grant Commission and uh, bo uh, board of the Institute of Fundamental Studies. So, what is uh, that is all I want to mention. Uh, what is um, remarkable in those days, professors are they are very tough. The student, you know go to the uh, uh, bend down and go to the ditch. Oh, uh, they are so afraid of these professors. 
and they come to the uh, lecture theater with a the clock. And uh, there are some several stories which I don't want to mention, but um, so that is the um, caliber of uh, um, professors that we had those days. Now we have changed it. Uh, right now I come to the, uh, uh, the Professor Mailwaganam started some research on cosmic rays. So this cosmic ray research uh, is part of actually part of space science, but those days that name was not there. It was only cosmic ray and ionospheric. Then Dr. Nyanalingam from ITI, uh, they were doing a lot of uh, good work uh, in 1960s and 70s. Then the research was abandoned uh, in that area. Uh, so now uh, we have a new branch called space weather very new, about uh, two decades old, uh, very new branch, because now people believe that sun has an influence on, on uh, terrestrial weather as well as uh, uh, space weather. Uh, so this is the sun, actually Copernicus put the sun into the center of the universe. Uh, later people thought that it is center is not, of the universe is not that, but uh, solar system it was, yes. So, the birthplace of space weather is basically the sun and also cosmic rays coming from space, but major activities from the sun. So this is a solar eruption, solar player, and uh, you can see the world, uh, Earth is, is very small compared to uh, such a solar player. And these uh, eruptions will eject, uh, eject uh, charged particles and the art particles move at the speed of 400 to 600 meter kilometers per second. And this is called solar wind. So when they come towards, if the eruption is taken place toward the earth, uh, these charged particles, these are called coronal mass ejections. They will come and hit the earth and it can destroy the whole life, uh, even plants and animals, everything, if not for this magnetic field. So the, for the presence of uh, life in uh, another planetary system, you have to have a liquid core, which will generate a magnetic field. And then only the, 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 you can protect, you protect yourself from cosmic rays and this kind of uh, high energy particles. So this is uh, the basic scenario. Uh, it's still that you can see that in the magnetic field, it get distorted because of this. And also there are two gaps here, not exactly above the pole. And from that gap, sometimes some particles will penetrate in. And that is the reason for Aurora. Uh, so about 95% of the sun's energy is uh, on uh, various activities and terrestrial weather, but 5% determines the space weather. Now let us see what the space weather is. Uh, right. So this is uh, the solar surface, 6,000 Kelvin. So if, uh, if we consider a brief history about the sun, uh, 800 BC, first uh, uh, possible observation of sunspot recorded in China, 800 before Christ, and no telescopes at that time. Then 200 BC, also the uh, Earth sun distance was measured with a kind of a factor, accuracy of 20, factor of 20. Then 1968, uh, first uh, mention of the solar corona. Uh, corona is that uh, you get the temperature inside the sun as 16 million or 50 million centigrade. Surface is 6,000 centigrade for Kelvin. But above the surface, when you, there is a solar eclipse, you can see uh, the corona. Corona has a very high temperature about uh, 1 million centigrade of Kelvin. And that is why uh, uh, that many people didn't know how it happens. Such a high temperature just above the 6,000 uh, centigrade photosphere. And now we know that it is because of the charged particles entangled with magnetic fields uh, will, uh, will break and it break and go. And that will create high temperatures. Uh, so this is sunspots. Uh, and it was uh, 
uh, okay, with the telescopes from Galileo Galilei that he observed sunspots, but uh, at that time, uh, nobody believed that they said the heavenly bodies cannot have blemishes. But uh, now we know about it. So sunspots uh, uh, activity has indication of magnetic field of the sun. Uh, right. So this is uh, uh, usually sunspots originated with uh, uh, north-south, north-south in the northern hemisphere and again north-south this way in the southern hemisphere. In 11 years later, the polarity changes. So in, in total, it is 22 years, the polarity, polarity roughly. Right. Then 1543, Copernicus put the sun into the center of this of the stage. And then 1609, uh, Kepler's laws came on planetary motion. Uh, and 1610, uh, the, the telescopic observations of the uh, sunspot were made by Galileo Galilei. Uh, and uh, it was Hans Lippert who discovered the telescope, but uh, Galileo used it. Uh, then uh, 1645 to 1715, sunspot disappeared. Then for, uh, first solar spectroscopy was done. So this is just bit the history. So sunspots are not always there, but certain areas there are a minimum period. Right. Uh, so these are uh, uh, not, they were not recently happened, but uh, moon day minimum means like that they have a minimum period mm -hmm. as well. Uh, so about the sunspots, usually sunspots originate here or here, mid latitude, and they gradually move toward the center. Why we discuss about these sunspots? Now this is the cycle of sunspots. Um, uh, they found that in 1852, sunspot cycle is linked to the geomagnetic activity. Right. So uh, that is uh, the effect of sunspots and the ejection of solar mass and distortion of magnetic field of the earth uh, can be measured associated with that. Now this is another uh, chart where it is said that, uh, you know, this is the number of sunspots. When sunspots are low, you expect, um, and then uh, that uh, the, the radiation, right? uh, irradiated solar radiation is also low. Uh, and then uh, now, uh, uh, this is what nowadays, we understood that it is very, very important to study. Uh, I will tell you why, because of the satellite system and many, many things that we have to protect our earth and then from these solar bursts, like in meteorites hitting the earth, uh, this is also, so we have satellites here, 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 all, all places, kept satellites to detect the solar wind speed and uh, charged particles coming to the earth. And in addition, uh, we have some stations uh, of measuring geomagnetic field or the pulsations on the ground. That's what I am going to discuss now because the whole network has how it affects the earth. Right. And then, uh, so this is uh, one of the uh, new era, era areas in, uh, in uh, solar observations. Right. So everybody knows about um, uh, Aurora because when these charged particles come and interact with about 50 to 80 kilometers above the ground uh, with nitrogen and oxygen molecules, they will uh, excite and then they excite and emit uh, colors, nice colors. This is happening only when you have uh, very high solar activity. Right, now what is space weather? Space weather refers to the conditions in space that can influence the performance and reliability of space ground and ground based technological systems and can endanger human life or health. Now, those days we never thought of having, a, you know, why we need the magnetic field for the existence of living beings here. We never uh, cared about it. But now, when we launch a, a, a spacecraft uh, to another planet, Mars or Saturn or wherever. The first thing that we measure is whether it has a magnetic field, because that is the most important part for the existence of uh, living beings. Uh, then, of course, you need the oxygen and ozone layer uh, to uh, filter out uh, ultraviolet, uh, etc. Uh, correct temperature and all. 
so it is the space to the is how the sun is not only the sun actually cosmic rays as well right charge high energy charged particles and low energy charged particles how they affect our earth and the and the um, um, uh, the instruments and uh, living beings so one simple thing is aurora uh, now this is terrestrial weather or just the weather hurricanes tornadoes and this is uh, space weather now this instrument is called soho solar uh, hemispheric observatory uh, it it is uh, it has it's in space so it has a camera uh, and in front of the camera there is a circular uh, blocking something right like a two rupee coin or something so that it can cover the sun only the sun and the corona can be seen so this is uh, uh, that you can see how the mass ejections can take place right so in uh, in monitor the and measurements thermometers are used in normal weather in space with the energetic particle sensors are being used and uh, normal weather also terrestrial weather you have no and with the service thing and even for space weather uh, now there are uh, centers established in some part of the world uh, for the measurement of uh, incoming charged particles and, and their effect on the earth so i am going to discuss some of these things uh, so space with the storms in in space and the aurora uh, so it can affect uh, airborne satellites astronauts the high energy particles the radiation burn and all and even uh, uh, even electricity generation power transformers now uh, what will happen is that when a, a stream of charged particles comes in and our magnetic field start to fluctuate and uh, and as a result the close in closed circuits there will be induced current so all power generation stations they 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 are very careful about this thing sometimes they generate more power than the necessary amount and the cables will go explode so this is one of the uh, major areas for non interruptive power supply that uh, we must study the solar uh, eruptions uh, and now of course uh, we are so advanced that when a satellite detects uh, a solar mass is coming towards the earth uh, from nearby uh, there are various techniques right and sometimes the power generation will be reduced sometimes even up to 25 percent in such stations like even uh, of course uh, uh, like uh, dynamo things like uh, even for, for our case it is lakshaban and various places mm, right so uh, so th there are uh, solar players coronal mass ejections from the corona mass will come out with the magnetic field and then solar particles come in right so there are some some such events like solar burst so we will now tell you or uh, show you uh, some of these uh, yeah interplanetary the, what is called interplanetary space is this space between uh, earth and the sun right and there are changes uh, and how it affects the earth uh, and it, in addition you can get cosmic rays as well um, so now uh, when the charge particles moves right, it generates a current also and when it accelerates it generates magnetic field also so this is charge particles in magnetic fields a plasma right and then uh, when they come here right it will interact with the earth's magnetic field uh, so sometimes the sun's uh, coronal wind or the uh, solar wind uh, will generate a magnetic field in this direction and earth this direction sometimes the magnetic field of the sun is this way and earth also this way so this uh, and during that uh, interactions you get various effects so this is about the magnetosphere uh, then ionosphere uh, is that what Professor Mailwaganam and all did was about uh, even those days they were very keen about it about 100 to 300 kilometer up 
uh, what is happening. Uh, because uh, when these charged particles comes, and I will show you, uh, there will be currents in the ionosphere, and that you can measure. They are very tiny currents, but you can measure. Uh, right. So then uh, now you know that uh, solar flare is light or particles, but coronal mass ejection is particles and electric fields, magnetic fields, sorry. And then uh, it can affect the magnetosphere and ionosphere. Uh, some solar cycles in the past, solar minimum in 1967, right. Uh, so, uh, you have this, uh, there is a small gap of cusp where the, uh, the magnetic, uh, sorry, the charged particles will penetrate into the earth. Otherwise, they will not come usually. Uh, so we are quite safe. Uh, right, this one such effect is uh, this uh, aurora. And actually, the mathematics in all is very complicated here. Uh, that how these uh, uh, tails are formed and then they break and go away and like that. So, so in 58, uh, explosive brightening, brightening was observed on the solar disk of the, uh, uh, from a observatory. And that was uh, said to be a, one of the major event uh, in geomagnetic storm. Uh, the charged particles comes here and uh, and interact with our magnetic field and it is a magnetic storm. Uh, uh, the turbulence. Uh, so it takes some time because they are coming at 400 to 600 kilometers per hour uh, per uh, kilometers per second. So it takes about a day or two, depending on the speed, to come to the Earth and hit the magnetic field. Uh, so we have enough time to prepare for such a thing if we measure uh, in advance. Uh, this is what we are going to now discuss. Uh, some cities will get dark in uh, going to the darkness because the underground cables will explode when you know, there is a solar stream, a storm uh, because high currents will generate induce. Uh, and then telegraphic uh, problems will be there, short wave, uh, long wave communication problems will be there. Uh, okay. A little bit uh, skip many things uh, because of the time availability. Uh, right. Uh, so this is 1859. The, uh, what, one of the uh, uh, well-known uh, solar burst. And then best known example uh, of space weather took place on March 13, 1989. And, and that is the one which uh, opened the eyes of, uh, of uh, scientists. Uh, because in 89, uh, there was a nine hour blackout in uh, Canada in Quebec city. And uh, they were wondering, they found that uh, cable, underground cable has exploded. But reason not known. But two, two or three days later, they realized that it is because of, it is because of the, uh, the geomagnetic um, storm generated by the solar wind, which hit the earth. So now, since then, that this uh, space weather is now uh, you know, developing as a special uh, field uh, to protect the earth. Right? So there are, you can see some other uh, examples uh, that we are, uh, earth was uh, uh, even in the Apollo 16, 17 uh, missions, uh, there were uh, problems. And yeah, I will show you in one simple, now this is what happened in the cubic, the explosion. Right? Because of the induced current uh, uh, due to the variation of magnetic field. Right, so this is also some such thing. Now in a nutshell, uh, of course, if you look at uh, that when charged particles come, many, many things happen, right? Uh, first of all, that it is the satellite system will be short circuited sometimes, uh, or sometimes it will reboot, we have reboot it. Uh, and then uh, because the power will short circuited. And then sometimes there will be static electricity 
in one side and sometimes uh, the, the the drag will be there right so there are these are serious issues because nowadays that uh, uh, in certain countries when you go there uh, that they don't give visiting cards i mean they give visiting cards but they don't have addresses only uh, gps coordinates are there uh, so if these satellites get <laughs> shifted or some drag go some kind of shut down uh, will be a, a, a severe problem for the people on the earth uh, and then astronaut safety because of high radiation and then uh, of course you get ionospheric currents and uh, short wave communication and uh, will be disrupted and another thing is that passenger planes uh, that airline passengers will also get exposed to high, high radiation uh, and um, electricity grids get induced currents and get exploded sometimes then pipelines, of course, uh, in Sri Lanka, we don't use this uh, uh, metal type one, but in some countries they use metal one, then the, the induced currents will be there. So the radio communication will be problems. Uh, right. Now, these are some flights. Uh, the, 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 uh, most of the planes that go through the uh, Arctic uh, circle uh, or above that, uh, will change their route because the, the communication problems will be there whenever there is a uh, solar eruption. Uh, and this is such eruption, and you can see uh, the effect will be uh, severe on uh, communication with, uh, uh, with uh, the passenger planes and also with satellites. So the radiation can also uh, directly damage the, um, the DNAs or oh, it can uh, uh, release uh, water, free radicals from water molecules and that can damage the DNAs. Uh, that is another uh, dangerous area. Uh, so the, these were not uh, known very much uh, in the past, but now uh, we are studying these things. Uh, some of the flights, they have exposure limits also. Um, so it's not a simple, but this is now you can see that CCD cameras in, in satellites take pictures, for example, get destroyed due to the attack of solar, solar, solar mass, I mean, the solar wind, right? So that is another effect. Now these are the geostationary satellites. You can see the large number of them are there. And this, uh, they will get dragged or that uh, induced charges and, uh, and uh, various other uh, effects will be there for the satellite system. So therefore, we should uh, minimize these effects by studying in advance uh, 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 solar wind that is coming to the earth. And then we can, we can uh, take precautionary measures. So that is uh, the, the purpose of this with the um, studies, right? Now you can see that uh, uh, the, the three phenomena are, uh, you know, the solar radiation storms, uh, these are uh, particle events, and then geomagnetic storms uh, and uh, radio blackouts. Now, I am not going to read this thing, but uh, because it's an interesting thing, uh, now, for example, there are a classification of uh, these uh, geometric storms, the G5 is stream, power systems, widespread voltage control problems and protective system problems can occur. Some uh, grid systems may experience uh, complete collapse of uh, blackouts. Transformers may experience damage, spacecraft operations, many uh, may experience extensive surface charging, problems with orientation, uh, the orientation of satellites, right? Uplink or downlink uh, or tracking systems will be destroyed uh, or disturbed so that you have communication problems uh, and tracking problems. Uh, other systems like pipeline currents can reach uh, hundreds of amperes. High frequency radio uh, propagation may be uh, impossible in many areas for one or two days, that is short wave. Uh, then satellite navigation may be degraded for days. Uh, low frequency radio navigation can be out of hours. 
uh, and aurora has been seen aurora no 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 problem but the rest is very uh, severe post um, severe problems right so then uh, so this is uh, the same thing that i have put there radiation doses for air travelers due to un unusually high levels of ionization radiation magnetic based equipment and compasses uh, etc etc so space and sub uh, Suborbital space industry, space weather events can cause satellite failures and high radiation dose to astronomers. Astronauts. Uh, right. So then, uh, uh, the the study of sun uh, using satellites recently uh, indicated that the the temperature of the sun is increasing, and that is the main one of the main reason for global warming. And not uh, carbon dioxide, of course, can be balanced by the sea. Uh, when the sun is uh, sun is that we cannot uh, control the solar sun's temperature is gradually increasing uh, whatever the precautions that we take on carbon dioxide emissions so then there are in us uh, and many uh, people they try to predict hurricanes uh, with geomagnetic storms right and then uh, we have in colombo uh, jointly with the Japanese uh, um, group, uh, have established. Uh, uh, you know, this is uh, uh, that uh, under the United Nations, uh, this uh, space program they recommended to measure uh, magnetic field uh, uh, disturbances on the Earth. So there is a system called MAGDAS nine, right? And that uh, one of the stations uh, we. Uh, established here so this is various effects uh, space weather and how it affects so uh, sri lanka has a unique position uh, because uh, our you know that uh, we have we are above the equator that is geographical equator but geomagnetic equator goes across the country uh, and that is the advantage that we are having for this kind of uh, 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 studies. So, uh, so this is the instrumental setup that we use. Now these are going in tandem with uh, satellites kept closer to the, the sun uh, in the middle and above the ionosphere. Uh, and then this is ground base. And all these measurements will be tallied, uh, tallied uh, to get the effect. Uh, so this is a GPS and this is a magnetometer uh, and uh, uh, and this is the data loggers. These are data loggers. So that what we have uh, done actually that this uh, geomagnetic equator uh, is uh, coming down toward the southward about 0 0.06 degrees per year. So it is moving. And right now it is the best uh, latitude for this uh, calculated. And uh, so uh, on the geomagnetic equator, right, the, the vertical component is zero uh, because horizontal component is the highest. So that is why it is important for the measurement. So uh, we went all over the country to find a suitable, uh, you know, the component, zero component with the, uh, uh, with the Z direction and uh, did some measurements and found a, a place. Uh, place uh, now these are, uh, this is the geomantic equator. It crosses Sri Lanka. And this is the Magdas 9, uh, 1 and uh, 2, 1 and uh, 2 and 9 stations all over the world. Uh, this is a joint effort to protect Earth uh, and our satellites and, and, and our aircrafts. Uh, astronauts and even um, uh, you know ground based uh, uh, you know animals and various uh, th things flora and fauna it affects so that what we do is that uh, uh, that uh, our one uh, and uh, this is the 52nd station uh, there are not many operating though we showed this year a few only one or two operating from equator so they are for memory dip equator so therefore, our Palumbo one has a very good uh, uh, recognition among the scientists. Mm, and this is how it was done. 
this is the team uh, with uh, and the first of the first the first thing is that this magnetometer cannot be kept uh, uh, kept cannot be kept uh, near a road if a, if a bicycle goes within 400 to 500 meters from the magnetometer it indicates the pulse so there should be no metallic movements uh, within 500 half a kilometer so we selected the coconut estate and uh, and uh, there was a, uh, we put a, uh, this magnetometer was put uh, stabilized uh, in a pit here uh, and then uh, the data was taken to another um, place right and alignment was very difficult but we have done and then uh, of course it was uh, it was covered with uh, coconut leaves and all otherwise the use will you know in this country very difficult to do any kind of field research because uh, any anything that they will steal so we have covered it now uh, and uh, so it is now since 2016 it gives data continuously to the network and we also get data from them any station for our our uh, our measurements for our calculations uh, right so this is a, 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 a effort that actually uh, to save the planet from solar bursts and uh, and, and coronal mass suggestions uh, and we have very good results and even if you go now uh, to this address and you can see uh, the total field and x y z h component uh, east component and uh, the down component uh, how they vary right in nano teslas uh, is real time right so this is uh, 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 this is the station in colombo uh, and uh, so we have a lot of uh, you know studies done on this uh, the, this is different countries of course right various various parts of the world moscow or rather mongolia there was Moscow also, Canada, various places uh, with latitude. Local time is here, the latitude, uh, they say, the variation is much high uh, at high latitudes or very low latitudes. Uh, equator is not much. Right? That is why these uh, planes are having problems. These are some research that we have done. And this is the interhemispheric field aligned current and the electrojet current calculations uh, associated with the solar wind and the uh, earth uh, magnetic field in the ionosphere. So uh, these are some during winter and summer that uh, ions will move one direction to the other direction. And uh, that is also we did some studies. Right, so this is uh, another research and uh, i mentioned that about uh, uh, that uh, the, uh, the 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 magnus 91 measures that if a, a group of charged particles come and hit the earth the changes in the magnetic field in, in micro pulsations can be measured and we can say that how how long will it take to come here and what are the changes that take place right uh, and and those information are very important for the power reduction. Some uh, power generation stations, uh, if it is a severe one, they reduce the generation of power to avoid any bursts uh, or the or the cable bursts. Uh, now, the other one is that uh, solar bursts, when sun erup uh, er solar eruptions take place, uh, you know that uh, charged particles can emit uh, in acceleration radio waves the low frequency and various frequencies of course so we measure the low frequency and so that we know that there is a burst here in advance so that uh, burst is actually uh, uh, you can see uh, uh, solar radio, radio burst so we call it radio burst because uh, the radio signals are coming out with this uh, burst right and then uh, uh, that burst, uh, you, you have to capture the radio signals from the sun after this burst from a, uh, from a an antenna. So this one we actually jointly do with the Clark Institute. Uh, and there is the, this, this is another like Magda's line, this is a system. 
right? And this is also in advance. Uh, the the MACDAS nine, you cannot detect it at uh, advance. It's afterwards. But this is in advance. Immediately, you can tell that there's something is happening in the sun. Uh, so radio spectrometer, and uh, we concentrate more on. Uh, uh, 45 to 870 megahertz region. So this is the antenna. Uh, actually, we develop an antenna which has uh, uh, much higher gain than the normal ones. Uh, so this is some kind of publications. Uh, so that is another uh, avenue or another uh, way of uh, detecting what is happening in the sun, and and uh, to get the idea about the. Uh, solar players uh, and uh, in advance, right? And that is also important, as I mentioned earlier. And then, of course, uh, this is the stations of the Callisto systems, uh, right? And this is, of course, actually, this is nothing to do with uh, space weather, I would say, but it is, uh, uh, the, uh, the, but this goes as uh, so studies with the solar that. Uh, the the ability to predict uh, severe weather conditions like hurricanes uh, using sunspot number this is a very complicated study of course uh, um, one of my students has done this thing uh, that it is uh, similar studies have been done in us also currently because uh, we know that uh, it is because of the uh, sun that we get all energy and wind patterns but we have no any studies done uh, how uh, hurricane will evolve if there is something happening in the sun or something. We never have done that thing. So, but this study shows um, uh, that one. Uh, for example, uh, uh, I will just uh, this, uh, just quickly go through the cyclones. Uh, usually, uh, we don't get usually cyclones in Sri Lanka uh, because of the Coriolis force. Because you need the uh, you need. Um, um, uh, uh, low pressure region is available only in the tropics up to uh, Bay of Bengal. And then you need the Coriolis force, right? 2 omega u sine lambda. So the lambda is zero on the equator, you don't get cyclones because no, no rotation force. Uh, on the polar region, you get uh, high rotation power of Coriolis force, but you don't get uh, low pressure regions because no solar light there. Yeah. So middle area like Bay of Bengal uh, in November usually every year you get uh, with the sun's movement you get low pressure regions and they generate and they generate and come to the come to the come towards us but they never hit and we should know that because of the Coriolis force the motion is also governed by the Coriolis force so they go and hit fortunately or unfortunately India right so uh, and we will be safe. Uh, but if there is a low pressure region here, another region here, and then this cyclone will come attract each other and hit the country. So this is the base for our uh, study actually that we studied all the cyclones uh, and uh, that uh, sunspot cycles and uh, temperature variations in all over the country, some 20 uh, stations, 22 metric stations. Uh, and because, uh, uh, and then uh, this is a criteria that we use. I will not go into the details of these things, uh, but uh, I will take the last part here. You can see that uh, temperature at the sunspot minimum and temperature at the sunspot maximum. And when you re reduce these things, if you get negative, you get cyclone. So that prediction is, uh, you know, nearly 100% okay accurate uh, so that uh, we will now try to develop it further but it's, it's uh, all these cyclones we can predict in this way uh, it may be different for usa but ours is island with ocean around it uh, so we have this thing uh, so finally uh, finally uh, that is uh, the other part of uh, space science uh, is basically high energy particles from exploding galaxies, uh, etc. So that part also we study here, right? Uh, jointly with the university, uh, gamma ray emissions from uh, uh, Blesa, right? So that is uh, another uh, uh, 
another part of the study of space science. Uh, so, of course, yes, uh, this is a uh, uh, little bit, of course, uh, complicated, but uh, because the, the, we get the data from Fermilab telescope uh, and uh, these data very tasks, of course, project. So they are not public domain. You, you cannot sometimes publish papers even uh, immediate with immediate results. Uh, this is Veritas uh, uh, um, system in Arizona, where you get uh, these uh, signals from uh, blazers uh, and exploding uh, other events uh, in the space and you measure uh, gamma rays. Uh, and even uh, very high, like 50 tau. Right. So then I think that with that, I will uh, conclude my uh, speech and we are contributing to a new field uh, because it is uh, very important to uh, protect our earth. And I, I have a short video uh, that you can uh, screen it uh, about this one. Shall I remove this thing or? No. Maybe I can escape it from here if it doesn't work. Hmm? Hmm? Hey, you got It was September 2nd, 1859. People all over Europe and North America woke up at night, confused and still tired. They were sure it was already morning. It was so bright outside. But when they looked out of their windows, they discovered it wasn't sunlight. The skies were lit by countless intense auroras, red, green, and purple. They were so brilliant, one could read a book as easily as in the afternoon. Auroras appeared even in the regions where they had never been witnessed before, like Cuba, the Bahamas, Jamaica, and Hawaii. Cool visual effects weren't the only thing that both mesmerized and horrified people. The most high-tech stuff at that time, telegraph wires, shorted out throughout Europe and the US. Sparks were flying from equipment, and many human operators got electric shocks. Papers and telegraph offices burst into flames. All the machines were immediately disconnected from their batteries, and still, they mysteriously kept sending broken messages. Fires, ignited by short circuits, spread over large areas. Colorful lights kept dancing overhead. All this caused panic and total confusion. Earth's inhabitants had never seen or experienced anything like that before. At that time, very few people knew that the sun was to blame for the chaos. One of them was English astronomer Richard Carrington. At about 11 a.m. on September 1st, the man was standing by a telescope in his private observatory. He was watching sunspots on the surface of the sun. Suddenly, two patches of intense white light broke out. They looked as bright as direct sunlight. At that moment, the astronomer didn't know what a terrible commotion these flares would cause. Later, it became clear that the sun had produced an epic geomagnetic storm and unleashed it at our planet's protective layer. 
Wave after wave of charged particles slammed into Earth's atmosphere. The planet's magnetic field wasn't powerful enough to stop them. It gave way, and the storm hit Earth, causing havoc. The phenomenon got the name of the Carrington event. So far, it's been the worst solar storm ever recorded. Good thing it happened when people didn't have advanced technologies and weren't that vulnerable to the sun's geomagnetic fury. The 1859 solar storm was three times more powerful than the one that happened on March 13, 1989. Three days before it began, astronomers watched a massive eruption on the sun's surface. Within a couple of minutes, a billion-ton cloud of gas was hurled away from the star. It rushed straight toward our planet at a speed of millions of miles per hour. On Monday the 12th, the huge mass of solar plasma reached Earth's magnetic field. This storm was so fierce, it lit spectacular auroras and created underground electric currents beneath North America. These currents must have found some weaknesses in the power grid of Quebec, Canada. In less than three minutes, the entire city lost power. Millions of people found themselves in pitch black streets, dark buildings, and stuck elevators. They woke up in freezing cold homes, unable to cook breakfast. The following 12-hour blackout closed businesses, airports, and schools. The Montreal Metro was also shut. In the US, hundreds of power grids started to have problems minutes after the storm hit Earth's surface. Luckily, none of these issues led to a blackout. The storm was severe enough to disrupt satellite communication systems and radio signals. Some space satellites tumbled out of control for a few hours. Lots of them had mysterious problems that went away as soon as the storm began to subside. No newspaper mentioned it, but in 2012, Earth had a close shave after narrowly missing an extreme solar storm, the most intense in the past 150 years. On July 23rd, Astronomers at Space Weather Prediction Center in Colorado spotted two clouds of energetic particles. They erupted from the sun's surface and barreled into space. Just 19 hours later, these clouds zoomed past the spot our planet had just left. If the solar eruption had happened several days earlier, Earth would have ended up in the line of fire. So, what if a solar storm as powerful as the iconic Carrington event happened nowadays? How much more harm would it cause? Would our life get back on track after such a disaster? Before you learn the answers to these questions, let's figure out what a solar storm is. The sun is a gigantic, constantly changing ball of molten gases. Every once in a while, it spews out bursts of energy, solar flares. They often go hand in hand with something called coronal mass ejections. Those are giant bubbles of ionized gas that can speed up to more than 600 miles per second. The most powerful volcanic eruptions pale in comparison with solar flares that release 10 million times more energy. Within a few minutes, one solar flare can give out billions of tons of charged particles. Solar flares are also insanely hot, with the temperatures reaching several million degrees Fahrenheit. Astronomers believe that such bursts of solar radiation happen when the sun's magnetic field gets twisted in some regions. At one moment, all the pent-up energy is released. The star sends out light and particles, mostly electrons and protons. Most solar flares last for minutes, but some continue for hours. Scientists classify solar flares depending on how brightly they shine in X-rays. You aren't likely to notice the tiniest flares if you don't have special equipment. Medium solar flares lead to fleeting radio blackouts at the poles, but nothing too serious. It's X-class flares people should worry about. They cause the strongest and longest lasting solar storms. When people think about danger coming from space, most of them imagine an approaching asteroid, like the one that wiped out the dinosaurs. But, apparently, we should be much more worried about our good old sun. A super strong solar storm heading toward Earth won't happen at once. First, there will be high energy sunlight, mostly ultraviolet rays and X-rays. They will ionize our planet's upper atmosphere and mess up radio communication. 
After that, a radiation storm will hit Earth. And finally, several days later, a colossal cloud of charged solar particles will reach our atmosphere. The particles will interact with the planet's magnetic field and wreak havoc all over the world. If an intense solar storm happened these days, it would start by disrupting GPS and knocking out satellites. If any astronauts were spacewalking at that moment, they would have a mere minutes after the first flash of light to find shelter. Their spacecraft would likely be properly shielded and safe enough. The main challenge would be to get inside in time. After that, the storm will proceed to interfere with satellite communications. That's why tons of your daily activities, from calling your friends to paying with your credit card, would be at risk. But one of the worst consequences would be connected with power grids. Power surges caused by the particles coming from the sun would damage giant transformers. Those take ages to replace, especially if hundreds or even thousands get wrecked. In some places, a failure of one power grid would make others collapse as well, creating a domino-like reaction. Picture living without electricity for a day, a month, a year. No light, no computers, no phones, water supply systems out of order, no food in supermarkets. Plus, without electricity, it would be next to impossible to reboot the already failed power grids. A powerful solar storm would cost people one trillion to two trillion dollars. And that's just during the first year after it happens. It would take the world another four to 10 years to recover. The damage to all kinds of satellites alone would reach $70 billion. Under majestic auroras, people would have to get used to a new, dramatically different lifestyle. No doubt, we'd have some kind of warning. Modern equipment all over the world and in space doesn't stop watching the sun even for a second. Once a bad solar storm happens, people would have some time to prepare, between several hours and a couple of days. And if transformers are taken offline in time, the consequences won't be so dramatic. Now, the following news might sound scary. There are also super flares. In comparison to them, our sun's burst of radiation are small potatoes. Super flares mostly occur in young and active stars. In 2016, astronomers saw such a phenomenon. A star 1,500 light years away from Earth produced a flare that was 10 billion times more powerful than any of those that burst from our sun. It doesn't mean we're safe here on Earth. Even our middle-aged sun knows how to produce super flares. But while young stars can have them once a week, or even more often, for the sun, it's once in a few thousand years. And still, if people don't figure out how to protect the planet, just one super flare can shred our ozone layer and wipe out life on Earth. Because it is running from the generator, I think we have some problems. Maybe a, a super player has hit the system. <laughs> yeah, okay. So we will stop it now at that point. There are about uh, five minutes more, but I, I think we will put it.
since it is 6 5 30 good time to stop okay thank you for all including uh, support given by the post media um, for this technical support and all Thank you very much, Professor Chandra Jaratna, for that insightful oration coupled with brilliant science in space to earth. So I would like to invite Professor Shanta Gamage, the president of IPSL, to present the Mayavangana Memorial plaque to the orator of this evening, Professor Chandra Jaratna. Thank you, sir. Uh, on behalf of uh, IPSL, it is a great privilege to conclude today's proceedings as a joint secretary of IPSL. Our orator of the day, Professor Chandana Jayaratna, thank you for gracing this event by delivering an informative oration on space, weather, and its effect on the earth to commemorate the Mailwaganam Memorial Day. Also, I cherish the volunteer dedication by the president of IPSL, Professor Shant Gamage, and the other members of the council to the success of this annual event. If we did not have the permission to conduct this event in the Department of Physics, University of Colombo, where the roots of Professor Mailwaganam was laid, this e event may not have been success. Therefore, I would like to convey my sincere thanks to the Vice Chancellor of the University of Colombo for granting permission to conduct this event at this venue, especially under the prevailing condition in the country. Also, I take this opportunity to thank the Dean of the Faculty of Science, the Head of the Department of Physics, all the academic and non-academic staff members who helped us during different stages when arranging this event. I express my sincere thanks to all participants who joined with us today in person and via Zoom to make this event a success. Further, I take this opportunity to invite all the members of IPSL to attend the annual get together to be held at Hotel Janaki Naharayan Peter. The event will commence at 6.30 p.m. this evening. So let's have a nice time at the get together. Thank you all.